Hey, thanks for listening to our podcast. If you want to listen live in the central Indiana area, you can hear us on 93.5 FM and 107.5 FM. From playing in a phone booth, becoming a Morse Reservoir All-Star, and earning status as an ambient player, it's time for the best of Coach Rick Venturi with a breakdown of yesterday's game. Brought to you by the District Tap. Craft beer on tap and damn good food. North at 82nd Street, just east of Keystone at the Crossing. And now downtown at Georgia Street in Meridian. All right, Rick Venturi is on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline after that cluster that was yesterday. He joins us now. I, I want to get back to, before we start talking about the game or anything itself, did you like how that the Colts front office-wise, coaching-wise, handled the quarterback situation throughout the week and then declaring Jacoby out on Saturday? Well, no. I, I mean, I think it, it, particularly in this respect is that, from you know, from what I gather, uh, Jacoby took, I mean, all the reps, almost all, almost all the reps going into the game, uh, which you know, if you if you had the idea that he wasn't going to play, and I don't think you waited till the last minute to make it, I mean, you would have had some idea along the way. Uh, you would certainly have, uh, you know, gotten Hoyer. Uh, much more prepared for the game. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not one to let the other team know whether I'm going to play Jacoby or not. I mean, I, I do understand, uh, you know, that kind of, um, uh, you know, secrecy to a point. I've never wanted my opponent to know exactly, you know, who to get ready for or what to get ready for. But I think from the standpoint, they probably had the ba- in the back of their mind the whole week they weren't going to play him. And then, uh, so I think in that respect, I think the preparation, I think Hoyer suffered uh, in some respects from what I gather uh, by lack of reps during the week. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's difficult in, in that regard. Uh, and, and you know what, this, <laughs> this last three weeks, and I know we won one of them, but we were very fortunate to beat Denver. Uh, this last three weeks has been a momentous meltdown. I mean, really – uh, of the highest order it's, it's, it's i think it's probably shocking to everyone it certainly is shocking to me you know i looked at one time like you know we would you know we would be a big time player and we still can be but you know we would be in control of our destiny in the afc i mean it you know it looked so good there for a two-week span uh, you know and then to come out and and play like this the only reason i'll call it a meltdown and not a disaster is that uh, if there is a silver lining, the silver lining is we're two and zero in the AFC South, and we got four of those games left. So you know we we do control in some respects a lot of our destiny in the AFC South. We can certainly make hay uh, in that regard. But you know, I mean, you know, the, over the three weeks, I mean, it's it's been a uh, it's been a mess. I mean, we have lost uh, games with uh, to teams with tremendous offensive uh, liabilities, teams that have been decimated. The Dolphins came in without their best runner, without their best receiver. Um, you know, and, you know, in that respect, I, I think it, it really is shocking. Uh, you know, and teams just seem to, the last two weeks, just impose their will on us. Um, you know, Pittsburgh, you know, Pittsburgh came in and we knew they did two things. They, uh, they took the ball away. Uh, and they sacked the quarterback, and boy, they came in, and they did those two things against us. <clears throat> and then I did warn, I did warn last week. I, I warned it on your show last Monday. Uh, I, I, I warned it in my podcast on on Wednesday. Uh, I warned it on sat, on Sunday morning with you guys on there. I said there's three things going there, that Miami do not take this for granted. They're going to come in. They're not playing like a one in seven team. They're playing hard. They're playing physical. I, I credited uh, Coach Flores with with that. I saw it on tape. I said Fitz is better than you think. He can will. He can will something to happen. He will compete and make plays. Uh, you know. And in the first two, they outplayed us. They out toughed us. They outplayed us uh, from beginning to end. Uh, Fitz did just enough, even though they didn't score a lot of points. Uh, they ball controlled the first half. Uh, he willed that touchdown with those two scrambles in the red zone, the touchdown for a 35-year-old man. 
And then I said the defense is unconventional. It's not what you're normally going to face. And they're going to put double sink in there. They're going to plan that over. Um, they're going to bring people from the outside, bring people from the inside, and they're going to look at exactly what you've done, and they're going to repeat all the things you've done. And uh, and they did all three things. And in that respect, they really – uh, they really imposed, you know, they, they really imposed their will on us. There's no question about it. They, they you know, they simply outplayed us. And, uh, you know, I'd like to talk about it. I mean, we've got things that have now have reoccurred here um, over over three weeks. I mean, number one, and, and this is not something people are talking about, is I'm telling you, John, we can't get, with our wide receivers, we cannot get – an ounce of separation unless the scheme somehow rubs them open. I mean, you know, we go again yesterday, and between Johnson, who all of a sudden appears on the team, we cut the only fast guy that can stretch the field that we have available at this moment without T.Y. We caught him on Friday. We bring a guy back in here, a journeyman guy, and so between him and Pasco, they catch three passes, uh, for 35 yards. If you add Rogers to it, it's five for 66. So you know, basically, they're just you're playing without wideouts. You're just absolutely shut out. And I didn't think we did a, a very good job of uh, creating space. I said all week you have to create space for Pascal. He's not going to do it on his own. And then we don't have anybody to stretch it. So what we've become, what we've become in the passing game, is a no separation team. Um, you know, we were we once we lost Hilton and Campbell, we lost a lot of speed, and then we cut speed. So now we're really slow, getting slower. If you want to know the truth, there's absolutely no vertical push, zero. And you know, Hoyer, yep, three interceptions, no question about it. When the ball leaves your hands, you're responsible. And uh, you know, he went from Cinderella, he turned into a pumpkin. There's no question about it. Uh, in one week. You know, but at the same time, I'm telling you, he's throwing into windows. There is nobody. There is no separation in there. So, you know, when you when it, when the fans look at the film, you take a really good look at that because that is a real issue. Everybody in my world, every coach in the NFL sees it, and that's why we're getting the defenses that we're getting. Our offensive line, and I said this in training camp, and then I thought we were through it in early season. And there's nobody that could be happier than Coach Goog, who they fired after last year, after they had the best offensive line year uh, that I can remember, and they fired him, and he's at Miami. There's nobody happier than him today. But I didn't think in the summertime, and definitely not now, I don't think that offensive line is playing with the what I would call anger and uh, you know, and, and basically the, the exactness and the precision – that you have to play with in that unit. Um, you know, we're beginning with the pressure on the quarterback and not being able to run the ball. We're, we're looking more like 17 than we did in 18. You know, we're missing blocks, key blocks. Um, you know, we're not running it. Uh, you know, we're running it, but we're not running it consistently. And when we get into red zone, you know, we have failures. Um, you know, we got a first and 10 in the red zone. Glowinski pulls, misses the edge guy. It's second and 13. We run one another series, first and 10. Nelson push pulls. He misses the edge guy on an edge blitz, just misses him, and it's second and 12. And then all of a sudden you get backed up with no separation, not receivers, Ebron doing his thing, and pretty soon you got a lot of bad plays, and that's what's killing us is we're having a lot of bad plays. We're not – we're not handling the twist and the stunts and the fires up front. Um, you know, uh, pass protection, uh, you know, even though there was uh, really only one sack, but it was a killer. I'm going to get into that later. A straight-up unblocked guy in the A-gap just knocked the hell out of Hoyer in a critical situation when we're down near the red zone. But they also had six hits. They had a lot of effects on him uh, in the course of the game. And so, you know, that's a combination I mean, the free blitz up the middle, uh, you know, it's either max or a turn, but there's total confusion. I mean, the guy was just wide open. And that's something they've been doing. I talked about that all week. They're an A-gap blitz team, and it just caught us all off guard. You know, all of a sudden now, you know, we're turning it over. 
Uh, and that's one thing where you do, I do believe you miss Jacoby. Jacoby just does not turn it over that much. Um, you know, Hoyer's the guy that'll take his shot. Uh, you know, he threw it into tight coverage. He looked the one in uh, that was really the killer, uh, the one that McCain got and ran it back to the 15. It ended up being the score. Um, you know, we're turning it over. Uh, all of a sudden in the red zone, we're one for five. You know, that's three points. <laughs> I mean, that's seven points, uh, you know, as opposed to a possible 35. I think the other thing that is really scary to me, and these these have come in the three games where we were, you know, considered the favorite, considered the much better team, is that we have really started slow. We have not been ready coming out. And what it, that has allowed, those first halves that have been listless, as somebody said this morning, I thought it was a good term, that those first halves, those slow starts have allowed the underdogs, including Sunday, and particularly Sunday, to dominate play early. Um, and when you do that, you know, when you do that, when you're a team like Miami, I say it all the time, is that it allows a team to gain momentum and, in, in fact, confidence as they go. I mean, our offense did not put up a point in the first half. Zero. Absolute shutout. And defensively, Fitz did just enough to move the ball. He didn't He didn't score a bunch of points. They ended up with 10. One was the scramble in. But at the same time, they dominated 18 minutes out of, out of your first 30 minutes. So they had the ball 18 out of 30. So, I mean, those are, those are just, the, you know, those, you, you have those slow starts. All of a sudden, you give somebody a shot, and then we're not an explosive team on offense. We know that going in, whether it's Jacoby or not. We're not a team that is, is going to put up a lot of points. And, you know, the way we're playing at receiver right now, we're definitely not going to put up a lot of points because you've got no playmakers. You've got nobody to make plays. And so, you know, if you let somebody in there and you let it down to one or two plays, that's what's going to kill you at the end. Uh, I'd say another factor is Ebron now. Uh, you know, he's showing us his uh, his best Detroit intimidate, uh, imitation. I mean, you know, he's, a, you know he's, he's, he's going in talking to the coach. The guy loves to make news. If he'd quit worrying about his image, worrying about saying what he thinks is the right thing and simply play ball – you know, he'd have a chance. And, and the sad thing is the way as bad as our receiver situation is right now, you're really trying to win with him, Doyle, and Hines in the passing game. I mean, that's that's what you're trying to win with. That's what you're there. And so you can't afford to have him, uh, you, know, running, you know, running average routes, dropping balls, getting the ball stole from him. I mean, those are things that are just, you know, just killing you. And then, you know, the next point, and I probably could put it number one, I said it was number one, and I, I'm still shocked that they haven't done something about it, but the kicker's ridiculous. I mean, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, if I hear one more time we have full confidence in him, uh, you know, then the guy's got to take a lie detector test because that's ridiculous. And, and I said this a week ago to you, 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 you uh, reaffirmed it. Uh, there, there's not a kick that he makes that I have any confidence in. And, uh, you know, at some point, like I said, you know, there has to be some accountability. Six extra points is just uh, beyond the pale. I think another thing, uh, John, is those fourth down gambles, which, you know, look so great. You know, they're starting to hurt us. We've, we failed on another big one. Those are big turning points, a big, big fourth down gamble. Uh, the Beagle kid, uh, if the fans want to take a look at that fourth down that we failed on, that is one of the finest plays this year. Nobody even talked about it, but Beagle did a great job. He kind of knocked Doyle off the route. Doyle was trying to sneak out to the backside on kind of a zone read, um, you know, kind of a little bit of an RPO, and he knocked him off, bought time for the coverage guy, and then Hoyer started to run, and Beagle ran across field and made that great tackle and and got him a yard short but you know that's two weeks in a row where you know our fourth gambles uh fourth down gambles haven't worked out so much so you know i i, I think some guys that you know knew something about the book over the years do know what they're doing i i get a little tired of the uh analytics justifying all this now i'll give you a couple offensive synopsis that just killed us um 
There's a series hey, hey, that we're hey, – Rick, hold on one second. Can I get that from me on the other side? Is that Absolutely, cool? John. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, no, that's okay. You're, no, 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 no. I, I want it. I want you to keep that in mind because I think we've teased people enough here. I want them to hang through the break and hear what you have to say coming up on the other side. Rick Venturi, it is must hear. We're live at Twin Peaks on this Veterans Day. We're back with Rick and more on the other side next. From playing in a phone booth, becoming a Morse Reservoir All-Star, and earning status as an ambient player, it's time for the best of Coach Rick Venturi with a breakdown of yesterday's game. Brought to you by the District Tap. Craft beer on tap and damn good food. North at 82nd Street, just east of Keystone at the Crossing. And now downtown at Georgia Street and Meridian. All right. Back to the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. The segments you have to hear every Monday with Rick Venturi. All right, uh, catch us up where you were before we hit a break, Rick. Now, I wanted to just say here, here's some typical here, – here, here is a typical reason that we are struggling and that we had a bad day yesterday. Let's go to the second quarter. Uh, it's 11.21, 11 minutes, 21 seconds to go in the second quarter. So it's early. Uh, we're moving the ball. We have a first and ten on the Miami twenty-five yard line, so we're just a we're just a second outside of that red zone. Matter of fact, I start the red zone at the twenty-five, so we're right there. So we're going to run the ball on the first play. Uh, we get into what I call a, a Big Twelve uh, formation. We put um, uh, the, the the seventy-three um, in there at tight end and and. Uh, and then we have 80, 81 in there next to him, Allie Cox, um, and they're they're in a in a wing formation. So basically, what happens is then uh, the the uh, the Dolphins play one of their sink defenses. So you know, some one guy blocks in, and one guy has to block the edge. Well, both of those guys go in. They both block inside. We run a play to our right. Harris busts through there, and all of a sudden he makes a tackle unblocked. Because of confusion, he makes a tackle for a three-yard loss. Now it's second and 13. Now we get we're going to throw the football, and all of a sudden they're in that double sink again. And I predicted that because that's what they play a ton of double sink defense on you, now, a little bit like a Buddy Ryan 46. And so now they got that double sink. So when you when you protect against the double sink, that means you got really everybody's covered at center and both guards, and you've got two guys on the edges. There's two ways that you can protect it. You can either man protect it, which means the guards have the threes, the center has the guy on him, the tackles are out on the edge, and the running back, which is Mack, has the A-gap blitz. Or you turn the whole thing down from Costanzo all the way down, you turn it down, and then you put Mack on the edge blocker. You do one or the other. Well, for some reason, there's confusion on there, um, and I can't tell by looking at the tape exactly because it's so confused. And that A-gap blitzer, he hits that thing, that Baker hits that thing so hard and totally unblocked, and Mac looks like he's not looking for him. I have no idea what happened, and he just blows Hoyer up. So, you know, all of a sudden now we go from first and 10 on the 25. Uh, now we're sitting at third and 26 back there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to throw an out cut just to get back in the field goal range. And Needham gets up on Pascal. We play stationary. Don't move Pascal. Leave him out there. And uh, what's his name? Needham just eats him up on the out cut. We end up throwing an incompletion. Now that's one series, but it's a series where, one, we didn't get separation, two, we didn't pick up the blitz, and three, we were confused on the running game. So, I mean, that in a nutshell, that in a capsule tells you everything. And then you come back later on the key interception, uh, you know, basically uh, the one that McCain gets and runs back to the 15. I mean, they have a stuffed everywhere. There is not – you can go through that tape and you can't find you, – you can't find an, an inch – of separation across the board. We run stationary, um, and, and Ebron is running downfield, rolls all over him. And Hoyer, now, you know, I think there's no doubt in my mind, Jacoby would probably have just lost this ball somewhere or took off. And Hoyer throws that thing down the seam, overthrows it right to McKay. And I've seen, you know, we've seen, I mean, we've seen Hoyer do that. I mean, if Hoyer plays long enough, you'll see the good and you'll see the bad. And, you know, uh, he just throws it up there. He, he stares it in. McCain just moves to the ball. 
picks it off, takes it back. Uh, you know, then Miami gets the touchdown they need, and um, you know that's it's kind of the end of, the end of it. But those, you know, those are the kinds of things that you do, and you just you're not going to recover from. You know, I think defensively, uh, we're not playing shutout football, and we're playing depleted uh, bottom feeders on offense. But I, you know, we're playing good enough numerically to win. Although somebody told me once. You know, sometimes you have to win a game three to nothing, just like you have to win one forty-five, forty-four. But we're keeping the point total down. You know, we're playing better. Uh, we got a, a good loose play game out of Leonard, a game where he was freed up a lot, didn't have to play through blocks. I thought Matt did a really good job of using him as a spy. Uh, that's something that he does really well. He got the rundown sack as a spy. He got a couple knockdowns. Um, you know, he got a big, big interception. Um, that should have been a game changer. But, you know, so obviously it was great to see him back. Houston, no question, is the force that we've asked for. Uh, he's given us everything he's got. I think, what is he, seven tack sacks now. Um, you know, he got the, a big sack again. Uh, he was eating Webb alive over there. Uh, pressure all day. Um, you know, basically plays the run. Doesn't compromise run defense to rush it. And I can't tell you what a big tip that was he had in the red zone. That tip, that ball that was tipped that got to that back, and that back had a shuffle. He had to slow down and, uh, you know, had to come back for the ball because it was tipped. And it bought Hooker time, who made a really good tackle. Hooker came from out of the free safety middle because that guy was wide open. They had us rubbed. They had um, Odom lost the coverage on him, just didn't see him going across. And, you know, again, it was a really good tackle by Hooker. I, I think it's the most physical play he's made since he's been here. But uh, if it's not for Houston's tip right there, uh, that's a touchdown. That's, that's, that's a walk-in, no question about that. So, you know, you, you really like there. I thought that Hunt finally showed us some football like he did a year ago. I think this was by far the best game in 19. Uh, he got good penetration. Um, you know, he, he made the he and Mohammed made the great rush. And again, that's what Fitzpatrick does sometimes is, you know, he'll try to make a play regardless, even though it's crumbling around him and he ends up throwing the ball right to Leonard. But I thought that, uh, you know, both Mohammed and, uh, Houston had really good rush on that play. I thought our rookie corners played a little bit better. Um, you know, the competition is way down in that game, but a little bit better, 37 Wellis is just really um, just a contact player. I mean, he's he's becoming one of my favorite players on this team because, boy, I'll tell you what, he's one of the best physical tacklers, um, you know, that we have on this team, if not the best. And uh, I thought that, uh, you know, really, again, I thought I got to just take my hat off to Hooker. I think in the last two weeks he's done some things that I had never seen, and that is – you know, become much more of a physical player. That was really a physical tackle on that uh, on that sway pass down there on that red zone. So, you know, that's uh, that's where it is. Um, you know, another yep. another dangerous uh, a game next week. A, a team yep. that the team yep. that has a lot of knowns and a lot of unknowns going in. So. Well. And, and I wanted to ask you this, too. We'll take a break and come back. A couple of things with Rick Venturi after we get past the top of the hour would be that Jacksonville and their knowns and unknowns, and it seems like right now the Colts have more questions than they have answers. What should be done with Venturi? Where the running game has been? Could they have utilized it more yesterday and then some? With Rick Venturi coming up on the other side, the segments you have to hear each and every Monday right here with the reaction to the Colts game and that loss to the Dolphins yesterday. 93.5 and 107.5 FM, the fan. From playing in a phone booth, becoming a Morse Reservoir All-Star, and earning status as an ambient player, it's time for the best of Coach Rick Venturi with a breakdown of yesterday's game. Brought to you by the District Tap. Craft beer on tap and damn good food. North at 82nd Street, just east of Keystone at the Crossing. And now downtown at Georgia Street and Meridian. Hey, welcome back. Rick Venturi, 5 o'clock hour. We're live at Twin Peaks. All veterans 
active duty military and reservists will eat free from a select menu uh, throughout the day here. $5 donation to the Folds of Honor organization. We'll see $5 back to spend on yourself here. Uh, it's a very special day. And again, we thank uh, all that have served, all that are serving right now on this Veterans Day. And that's why we're here at Twin Peaks. And you can join us here at 82nd Street and I-69. Back to Rick Venturi right now. What? Listen, I, I know we've both had similar thoughts regarding Adam Vinatieri for the past couple of weeks. The, the Colts are in a bad situation right now because, I mean, I mean you're going to have to either be just shatter the dude, put him on IR, I, I mean, you're going to have to bring some people in this week, aren't you? I mean, without a doubt. I, I can't. I just can't see that you don't move on. Honestly, I, I'll be honest with you. I, if, I mean, don't tell me that there's not somebody out there that will make more than eight out of fourteen extra points. I mean, at some point, I said it last week. You can be good. You can continue to be the good guy. You can live in denial. You can use all that uh, false confidence. Uh, full confidence in him, and and I said as we ended the show, and you can keep losing football games, and we lost another one. So, you know, at some point I used the Belichick Bernie Kosar analogy. You know, again, if you if you really if you do hold everybody accountable on your football team, you, you know, then at some point that means everybody. That doesn't mean fifty, you know, fifty two guys or fifty one guys. That means everybody is is accountable. I mean. Uh, you have a kicker that misses, you know, 10 kicks, and you cut your rookie wide receiver. I mean, I've, I always say, well, I'm not quite sure why, why that is, you know. So, you know, I mean, to me, it's hard to believe that you can keep going on this way. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. They brought a parade of kickers in back in September, and then everybody thought he was fixed. But I'll tell you this. Not only has he made this extra point an absolute adventure, normally that's when you go to the bathroom, but now it's such an adventure you sit there and watch. But even his makes are ridiculous looking. That, that make oh, before no, the that missed ridiculous. extra point barely squeaked in on that left upright. Well, that's what I said. I said in, re, in response to those statements about how much confidence they had, I, I said, I'll be honest with you, I have absolutely no confidence. I mean, you're exactly right. There's not very few clean balls through the middle. I mean, you watch if you watch that kid from Miami, I mean, every ball, you know, and, and obviously he hit them all, but every one of them was a straight shot right down the middle, and I, I, not, not many people have heard of him. I mean, so, you know, I mean, obviously I can understand, at, you know, why there was a few extra chances given here because of background and because of the capital that he's built up in his career. But at this point, I mean, you know, these are these are disastrous losses here. These are, you know, these are losses to teams that you should beat. And really, if you do nothing else but kick, you win, regardless if you played well or not. So, you know, I mean, you know, at some point there has to be, a, a you know, an accountability factor here. How does that uh, affect the locker room? With everybody else's accountability, how does that affect the fan base that are saying, hey, this is what we hear all the time, and, you know, there's no – I mean, you, you try to put one over on us, there's no way you can feel that way. Well, it, it blows your credibility. You, you know, now when you have a press conference, you know, after a while, nobody's going to pay attention because it's basically spin and rhetoric. I mean, that's – you know, it does that. I, I think the Colts have a unique locker. They have a, a bunch of front row guys. This is not a – they don't have the veteran type of uh, guys that would uh, really, you know, really respond to this. I mean, this team is built with a bunch of young front row guys, which which is good in one sense. And so I'm not sure that they're really as big into that as some other teams that I've coached. It's uh, Rick Venturi. He's on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. What in the world has gone wrong with this offensive line? Because it has been extra cruddy for three weeks now. Well, you know, I'm I'm not really sure. I, I never felt, you know, I I always question, and I go back to this, and I questioned it then, uh, and I'm not just saying this after the fact, and, and on this uh, ironic day of, of uh, Googs coming in here and, uh, and winning against us, but – I, I really questioned uh, why we would let him go. And I understand he's not a front row guy. He's not a fellowship of Christian athlete guy. He's a, you know, he's a guy that can, uh, you know, he causes disruption on times. He's, you know, he can be gruff and crude and that. But I'll tell you one thing. He did a great job with this team, this offensive line a year ago. I, I raved about it both on the running game, 
um, you know, the past statistics everybody uh, everybody was aware of, number one in the league and fewest sacks. But I thought, you know, also one of the best designs and executed, designs and executed running games that I had seen in cold football for a long time and even when Edgerin was here it was a different kind of running game it was a it was a run pass mix game that that mixed so well but last year you know it was a it was a running game uh you know by design um and so I was just I I was shocked and I because I I think I think pro sports is, it really is not about personalities it's it's about talent whether it's coaching players I think you have to live with some of that so you know, I'm not saying that the change itself has done anything, but the results aren't there. We're not as crisp. Uh, you know, we had a bunch of assignment errors. Even Jack Doyle said basically after the game I was watching him, he said, you know, they were coming from all over. I don't know if it was miscommunication uh, or whatever, but it's just not there. I mean, the result is not there, John. It's not – you know, and we've seen our top guys. We've seen Nelson. We've seen Costanzo. It's all up and down that line. You got to throw the backs in there in terms of protection, but uh, it isn't nearly uh, as sharp as it was. And plus, at this point, I got to be honest with you. You know, and I've I've been saying this for weeks, and it's a reoccurring theme. Is in my world as a defensive coordinator, you look at this team. And you say this team cannot push it deep. They cannot run. They have a bunch of schematic receivers that cannot get open on their own if we get up in their face. And so now what you do and you say, you know, okay, and they're not picking up second-level blitzes. You know, they're not edge blitzes. Anything that comes from off that isn't declared, they're having trouble with. So that's what you do. You, you figure out a way to bring five. Uh, bring it off the edge, bring it up the middle, but don't show it, and then get up in our grill and play us tough man-to-man coverage. And, you know, and if we don't bunch or stack every down, you know, every time we're stationary, you know, it's like I said, there's just watch the game from beginning to end. There's just very, very little separation. The one time that we hit Pascal over the middle early, they do play a soft zone on that down. Yeah, you know, but teams are smart. They're not going to do that. And one thing I do worry about Jacksonville, and I said this a few weeks ago when everybody was talking about the Houstons, I don't think, this is my own opinion, as much as we've played Houston and the same staff and as much as we've played Tennessee, I don't think those two teams have nearly as good a handle on playing us uh, defensively as does Jacksonville. I think that we have struggled more with Jacksonville and they always bother me a little bit from that standpoint. And, you know, we've never played them very well on defense. I mean, you know, even with Bortles, you know, they, they've had some big, big days against us, but you know, when it was all said and done last year in that really good run that we had, you know, in the, in, in that run in the second half of the season, the one, uh, the one bleak day was a shutout, a six to nothing shutout by Jacksonville in week 13. So, You know, I worry in some respects about Jacksonville because I think they understand how to play us. Um, They don't fear us. Uh, They've got a really good corner in Boye. Even though they lost the other guy, they still have uh, Boye, and they have, um, you know, good, uh, really good nickel player, um, you know, in Hayden. So, I mean, they can play man-to-man. They can get up and play. When they're not man, they play a tight quarters on you. Um, but they kind of know how to play us. And then if they get in that Daytona beach, <laughs> they get in that Daytona package, um, you know, which puts Allen, their rookie, who has seven sacks, the kid out of Kentucky, in Gawkway, who just killed us. He killed Costanzo a year ago. Uh, and then you kick Campbell inside, who has been a, a cold killer, um, you know, you know, the, you know, and then you, and you put Smoot in there. That four guys now, they've got 20 and a half sacks. So, you know, when you when you get in there Sunday, you've got to win those first downs, and that's not just running because, you know, teams are putting that they're putting the, the they're they're stacking the deck. There's numbers up there. You're you know that's why you can't say we're going to establish the run because if somebody wants to take it away, they can do it with numbers, and that's why we've got to find ways to throw the ball. And I mentioned that last week. Now we did try to do some of it. I didn't think that we stacked and we moved Pascal enough. I I was shocked that Johnson was in there, period. 
Um, but I was I was a little bit surprised that we didn't move Pascal because he was our only wide receiver that really has any threat at all. And I didn't think that we did a really good job there. And then we did try to get it to Ebron, and he, you know, he was who he is. And we got it at times. We got it to Hines, and I thought, you know, I had said Hines and Ebron, and and create free access for Pascal. That's what you have to do. And you know, we just weren't, you know, high, you know, uh, you know, we had drops uh, by 85. I thought Hines did a really good job, you know, when he was in there. And I think you have to create it. Uh, you know, their starting linebackers, good, Najee Good. I don't think he can stay with uh, Hines on the on the option routes. But uh, they know how to play us. And um, and then on offense, on offense, you know, they've got a premier, uh, just a just a premier running back. I mean. Uh, he is really playing uh, his tail off uh, for net. They, the two guys you got to stop on their offense are the two Bayou Tigers. Would be really happy after Saturday night. But uh, Fournette um, is really off to a good start. Uh, no question about that. You know he has uh, 831 yards rushing. Um, he's got 1126 total. Um, you know this is a this is a premier back in our league. This is a guy that. You know, can hit it up in there. Tremendous spin power move. Uh, can hit a home run. Um, he can catch it and go. Um, he he's just a really really top player. Um, and the kid that's coming on is the other Bayou Tiger is is uh, DJ Shark, um, number seventeen. Um, you know, who ran the four three four in the combine forty forty vertical. And, uh, you know, he can really – he can get deep on you. He's their go-to guy, their all-purpose guy. Uh, they're real marginal after after those two guys in skills. But they've got two guys that, uh, you know, and I – you know, and, and, and Shark's off to – you know, he's off to a good year. He's got 692. He's got two – he's got six touchdown passes, which puts him in the top ten. So, you know, there's a couple threats there. Um, and then, of course, now you have the unknown uh, because you have Foles coming back. So in some ways, you know, you, you, you know who Foles is, but you don't know who he is from Jacksonville. Um, but, you know, he's going to start. So it's, it's a little bit like an opener from that standpoint. I think that, you know, they have had two weeks because of the bye to get him ready. You know, this is a guy that's had big moments. He's been a Super Bowl MVP. He's been a pro bowler. Um, the one thing that scares me, I always think about this. He had a record 25 consecutive completions in a game, and he's had seven touchdowns in a game. So this is not this is not a guy who hasn't had great moments. Now, I will say this. I don't think when he's had the keys to the kingdom, he has ever been nearly as good when he went to St. Louis, when he was given the job in Philadelphia with the injury. I don't think he's ever been as good when he's had the keys to the kingdom and he was like the guy from day one, he's been much better when he kind of comes in off the bench at mid season or whenever, and more or less plays on house money. And then he's just lit it up. And that's always been with Philadelphia. So we don't know, but this is a guy, like I said, with big moments. Um, I think that he'll be much more decisive in the passing game. Uh, I think they're going to look us over, uh, if if we play a lot of zone, he's going to be real patient. He's going to pick and choose and try to move the ball that way. They don't have great receivers. Uh, Shark is a potential. Shark is a potential big play guy, uh, but they struggle in different places. Um, their offensive line is so so. He'll be more decisive, but I also don't think he will be as elusive as Minshew was. Minshew was a guy that kind of got out of trouble. Was kind of wild horse rider and kind of hid uh, what I think is a real average offensive line at best if it gets into protection game. So, you know, I you know the big thing here is you got to get ahead of the count on them. You can't let Fournette go. You just cannot. You got to stop that and and play action. I would bring a lot of edge pressure against them. If you watch them, they play in a phone booth a lot. They 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 really tighten the formations. The offensive line is really tight. A little bit like when Howard Mudd was here and they would protect the insides and make you come from the outsides. But I don't think they have a guy that would release it as quick who had a, you know, a time clock in his head like Peyton did. So I, I would bring a lot of edge pressure because those edges are tight. 
and I think you can disrupt the run and set the edge, and then I think you can get over the top and affect some of those play actions because that's what, that's what teams do to us. They run quick pass play action on first down, and, uh, you know, I, I see that part of it. But, it, you know, just like I said, that, you know, the last week, you know, there's – if if we don't start bringing our A game, I mean, this thing could get away from us. Um, and it's really a shame because we really were in the driver's seat and we've played ourselves back out of it. But as I said, the good news is you have four AFC South games left to go. And, of course, then in December we're going to be in my other old division. We're going to be in the NFC South. So it's all about the South in the next seven weeks. So, Rick Venturi, uh, these segments you have to hear every Monday is on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Deion Kane, by the way, was released or waived, as we talked about earlier on Saturday. Uh, he um, got um, placed on the practice squad. Nobody claimed him, so right. he's back on the Colts practice squad right now. What, what do you think of all that? What do you what do, what do you think it came down to as far well, as doing you know, what they did with him? His, you know, his production isn't there. So what you what they did is they they treated reliability, you know, which was bringing Johnson back. Johnson's yeah. played for him in San Diego and all over. I mean, he he knows the offense. But the problem is when you bring in those front row guys that are not creative, that are scheme guys, and you get a team full of them, you know, guys in my position as defensive coordinators, they know that. They know there's no speed, so they're going to sit on you. And people are just sitting on us. It's absolutely amazing. And the one thing that I thought, and I said this on your show last week, I was, I, you know, I, I didn't see Kane getting cut. I would have used him even if I never threw to him just to stretch it, just run X post and take a corner and a safety out of there and free it up for some other people. But there is absolutely no push in the defense. I mean, we're trying to push the ball downfield to Ebron. You know, and those good defensive backs, I mean, they, they eat him alive. I mean, he he's good in close quarters in the red zone, but he's not a wide receiver out on the field. So, you know, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how it goes. Um, again, this will be a really interesting battle because I said this. With Jacksonville, Jacksonville always is a challenge because they played us, like I said, they played us off their feet. They killed us on defense a week a year ago with a shutout in week 13. And now with Foles, it'll be, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of unknowns going in Sunday. No doubt. Rick Venturi, he's on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Man, I knew you were going to bring it today. We were kind of going back and forth yesterday. And now <laughs> – it's it's so sad when you think about it because they were in such a great position and this AFC hasn't really looked like what we thought it was going to with some of the failures out west and now they've moved themselves back into a situation where you're battling with the Tennessees and the Jacksonvilles within your own division and kind of making must wins out of yeah, these situational absolutely. matchups coming up here. They so. are they oh they're absolutely must wins because you lost to Oakland and Pittsburgh you know, yep. two teams that are in the hunt for wild cards. So, yeah, these these division games, uh, this next three weeks is make it or break it. It is. Always awesome, buddy. Thank you, Rick. Okay, John, I'll talk to you later this week. Rick Venturi on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline. Podcast that up, 1075thefan.com.